introduce our mayoral candidates to the stage. From my left, Jennifer Doherty. So in tonight's forum, I'm going to be inviting our candidates to give one minute opening and closing statements. In between, however, we will have nine rounds of questions. Uh, what we hope is a unique feature, we're going to try and encourage some interplay between, between the candidates. Uh, each candidate will take a question from me. The other two candidates will have 45 seconds to respond. And then the candidate who took the question will have 30 seconds of rebuttal time. Uh, I'll walk us through it as we go, so we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully get no confusion. Uh, candidates, please keep your eyes on the timer light. No surprises here, 15 seconds. Amber goes up, and red means stop. So let's get going with our opening statements without further ado. From my left, please, uh, former Jennifer Doherty. Good evening, and thank you for coming. And I am Jennifer Doherty, and I want to be your mayor again. I am going to tell you briefly uh, how I'm going to win. I'm going to win because you understand that old political loyalties and political parties are not serving us well. And I'm willing to stand for Frederick and not a political party. I asked many of you to sign a petition, and more than 1,425 of you did sign that petition, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, saying you wanted a viable third choice. And I will win because you know that I will tell you the truth. You know that I will win because I trust you. I trust you to look at information and you can read a budget and an audit as easily as I can. And if you look at the city budget and audit, you will know that I do not have to manufacture scary statistics or give you bum information about doing more with less. I look forward to the conversation tonight and I do ask for your vote in advance on November 5th. Very good, thank you. Please give a round of applause. The opening statement of one minute, Mayor McClellan. Good evening. My name is Randy McClement. I am currently your mayor. I'm asking to continue to be your mayor for the next four years. I want to thank the FMP, FCC, and uh, WFMD for hosting this event tonight. Um, I'm honored to have had the opportunity to serve as your mayor, and I wish to continue another term. My commitment to the citizens has been, and always will be, to serve, provide sound judgment, fairness, professionalism, compassion, and stewardship. The last four years have been challenging ones. We faced all kinds of interesting challenges such as blizzards, earthquakes, economic downturn, challenging state regulations. But you know, this administration has worked through each of those challenges and kept the city moving forward in a positive manner. I would like to be able to bring my knowledge, skills, and experiences to bear from the last four years again for another four years. So thank you very much and welcome and thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you. Old woman, Karen Young. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. This is such an important part of the political process. I came to Frederick in 1996 as the Chief Marketing Officer at Farmers and Mechanics National Bank. My responsibilities included marketing, strategic planning, and training. I've been in banking for well over 30 years, and because of that experience, I've learned a lot about banking, leadership, financial analysis, risk mitigation, and best practices in human resource management. I also, working for a community bank, got very involved in community service. And at a certain point, I realized I love the community service more than the banking. So what I try to do is bring my skills from the private sector to the public sector. And over the past four years, I have worked tirelessly to deliver better, stronger customer service, work in strong partnerships at all levels of government, and bring a new discipline to fiscal responsibility. Thank you very much. Please round of applause. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty with our nine rounds of questions. Each candidate's going to have the opportunity to start off a round. We're going to give you one minute, 30 seconds, to answer that main question. The other two candidates will then get 45 seconds to respond, and the candidate who took the question will then have 30 seconds to close us out. We're going to start with Mr. Doherty. 
Let's kick off with your views on creating public-private partnerships with Frederick government. Uh, are these worthwhile? Do they have potential for the city? If so, in what areas? To what degree should the city be subsidizing uh, private uh, enterprises with public money? Uh, and what government services are off the table for privatization? For privatization? Mm -hmm. All right. The idea of public-private partnerships have come about in the last 25 years because government doesn't have enough money to do work. We have to get uh, a couple of projects going, roads projects particularly, major infrastructure projects are good areas for public-private partnerships. Road clubs, I've suggested the infrastructure bank that some other candidates do endorse and I think that's a good idea on the local level. The only way to make sure that this happens is that we have a strategy and we have money set aside and the city contributes, the county contributes, and the state contributes when it's appropriate. We have had these uh, ideas on public-private partnerships on other infrastructure needs, such as parks and playgrounds, this water park idea that I keep hearing so much about for Hargett Farm. But right now, the city is the only one on the hook for Hargett Farm. That would have been a good private event uh, development rather than a city one. Where, what is off the table in terms of um, future public-private partnerships, in my view, is competition with the private sector. When something is not an essential service, public uh, direct services from government, obviously, uh, the roads and water and sewer infrastructure are important, but the hotel conference center, that is not something that the city should invest in. I also think that public-private partnerships should continue um, or, or be pursued with parking. We did that once on the uh, Carroll Creek, and I think those are good opportunities for us again, because structured parking is so costly. Very good, thank you. Uh, Mr. McClement, 45 seconds. Sure. Um, there's all different levels of public-private partnership. Uh, one that uh, Jennifer brought up was the Hargett Farm. We have been working with a number of entities, uh, the local swim pubs, YMCA, Board of Ed, Board of County Commissioners, Frederick Moore House, uh, Hospital, to try to find ways to put an aquatic center on Hargett Farm. Uh, that was one intention for us to do in the long term. And this is a way to draw in all that different aspects to um, make this a reality. Other aspects too are just how we communicate with our um, residents. We drew a lot of information from residents through committees and commissions that were formed, ad hoc trash committee, uh, soft recycle committee. Uh, we brought in the expertise from our local area to help us move government forward. Thank you very much. Ms. Young. Public-private partnerships are absolutely critical for the future. It's the way we've got to go. We just don't have the revenue sources that we have historically, and we need to be innovative about how we fund things. So this is the logical route to go. The lieutenant governor put P3 legislation into place, which now gives us structure to do that. And I think there's virtually a number of areas, all areas, that we can utilize this. The most obvious is building our, rebuilding our failed interests, infrastructure, but even the concept of social entrepreneurship involves public-private partnerships. They're critical for the future. I think infrastructure bonds are a better solution than infrastructure banks, easier to implement. Thank you. Let's do it. Um, the one thing that we need to look at in terms of future planning is the possibility of a STEM high school in the city of Frederick. The science, technology, and engineering and mathematics really have to be the focus of our, of our energy. We have the technology experts here in the private sector, and one of the issues on my website, which I hope you'll check out, is the idea of a STEM high school and bringing the private, sectors, the private sector involved in that. Thank you very much. Our next question goes to Ms. McClamond. Uh, I know you're probably getting sick of this question, but I'm going to ask it again anyway. Uh, like it or not, the city's pension liability has been one of the issues in the campaign. Um, do you feel you're doing enough, the city hall doing enough to tackle this problem? It's always a good question to ask. Um, this has been uh, a, a scenario that's been building up for a long time. Um, this administration decided to take it head on. Um, we've done a number of things to try to close off some of the, the concerns. Um, we first looked at what we called the low hanging fruit. What are the new employees coming on for both pension and um, health care benefits? 
Um, so one of the things we did was for OPEB, the post-employment benefits, we've closed off that plan so that um, the, they'll stop the bleeding for the future. Um, the pension is one that we were looking at a number of different um, uh, ways to, to move forward with our actuary to find out um, how to uh, get better return on our dollar, like uh, from our uh, taxes, uh, excuse me, from our, imp uh, uh, I'm having one of those Kelly moments, sorry. Um, having uh, the uh, investment trust committee, sorry, uh, to find out better ways to invest our, our money for the future in the pension and the OPEC uh, funds. Uh, this is not a marathon. Uh, this, is, um, this is this is not a sprint. This is a marathon, and we need to make sure we take this uh, step carefully. And we have to work with our um, employees and our citizens to make sure we're investing their money correctly. Thank you very much, Ms. Young. Well, clearly we're not doing enough to deal with it because it is recommended that we be funded at the 80% level and we're only funded at the 50% level. So the numbers alone would suggest we need to be do more. This is a very politically hot issue, which I think is one of the reasons we haven't dealt with it aggressively enough. The other reason is that there are a lot of legal limitations in terms of what you can and can't do. I would implement a process whereby we look at what our employee base finds more acceptable, ask them to prioritize, and also we look at what will pass the legal mustard and we move forward. Because it's our responsibility to make sure that our retirees and our future retirees have what's promised them in their pension. Great. Ms. Dart. In 2003, the Chief Financial Officer was John Leisingring, and he advised me to try to convert from the defined benefit to the defined contribution plan. We brought that to the Board of Aldermen. It didn't go anywhere. Some of you might remember the history of the Board of Aldermen and I didn't always get along. But we were right. We were right to bring that forward and I would bring it forward again because it only got worse in the intervening years um, in the Holtzinger administration with the early retirement buyout when the 30-year plan went from 80% funded to 53% funded. My plan exempts current retirees, allows those within five years retirement to opt into the new plan, allows those in the contract to opt in in the next contract, increases retirement age, converts to a defined contribution plan, and splits plan costs with employees. It's hard, it's complicated. We should have done it 10 years ago. We tried, I would do it again, and the aldermen are eager for it now. Mr. McConnell. Okay, now that I got my head back on again, um, some of the things that we've we have done is um, looked at the benefit formula, normal retirement age, rule of 90, uh, early retirement age, employee contributions, cap COLA, and vesting. These are the uh, items that we're moving forward with now to start the process to close that gap. This administration has made the commitment to be 80% funded in 20 years, and that's the goal that we should be trying to shoot for. Thank you. Moving on to Ms. Young. Uh, this may, may not seem like a particularly city-related issue. However, Citizens Care and Rehabilitation Center and Montague Assisted Living are located within Frederick's boundaries. Do you, do you have an obligation to act on behalf of city residents to protect their interests when a conflict exists with the county government? And should you intervene? And if so, how? Well, I've already been on public record with my opinion on that, so I will repeat what I have said already. If an issue is important to the citizens of our city, then it becomes an issue that the mayor and the board should deal with and become involved with. In fact, I recommended that we put that issue on a workshop agenda. No vote, just a discussion. Allow our citizens to come in and talk to us so that we can determine what role we have and what we could pursue. Unfortunately, that was denied. I'm not in agreement with it. But I do think that when you have issues, and whether it's Citizens Montague <laughs> or any of the other issues that the county is struggling with, it is our responsibility to our citizens to give them a forum for discussion and to represent their views at all levels of government.
government. We are our citizens' champions, and we must never forget that. Thank you. Ms. Doherty. It is absolutely the obligation of city officials to stand up and be heard. And whether they choose to act as the mayor and board, as they probably should have or not, is uh, perhaps moot at this point. The Board of Zoning Appeals, or excuse me, the zoning, uh, the, the zoning Board did have an opportunity and is looking at it again on whether it is appropriate for that land to be split. I think it's appropriate for the mayor uh, to testify in front of the ZBA to make that position of the mayor and board clear if they are willing to stand up for citizens who are within the city limits. I don't think it should be privatized, and I think the county has an obligation to fund it, and I would stand up for the citizens who are residents at Citizens in Montevideo. And for the record, my father is a resident at Citizens. Thank you. Mr. McClellan. I think one of the main goals is to make sure that we are communicating with all um, of our local jurisdictions, uh, the county especially. We need to be able to uh, express our views, but we need to um, be able to understand where our, our differences lie and where our responsibilities lie. So we need to make sure we're open communication. I think having the new way of government coming with the county, uh, with the county executive and a new council, I think it would be a lot more efficient for us in the future as a city-county relationship. Thank you. Ms. Young. One of the earliest principles I learned in my career was never to say to your boss, not my job. And as an elected official, one must never say to our bosses, the citizens, not my job. As I said earlier, if it's important to our citizens, we can share our limitations, but we should never say, we won't take a position, we won't fight for you, we won't do what we think is best, because it's not within our purview. Very good, thank you. We'll come back down to this end of the table. Ms. Doherty, <laughs> I touched on the interaction between city and county with my last question. And as you're well aware, the county will move into a completely new form of government by charter following next year's elections. And one of you as mayor will have to deal with a county executive and council rather than five co-equal commissioners. What do you anticipate will be the biggest challenge of that newly configured relationship? The biggest challenge facing the city and the county relationships is going to be one basic fact. My time can't be up quite yet, Terry. Um, <laughs> and and the, the, facts of the, the fact of the matter is the city residents are double taxed by the county and the mayor and board have, have made some position uh, unclear to the, to the residents that they're not willing to fight for uh, the discussion on double taxation right now. They want to wait until the, next, uh, till the next election, the next statewide election, to address the issue of double taxation. If we look at my personal tax bill, my house is valued at $317,000. If you count out the things that I don't get from the county but I pay for, I would save about $1,064 a year. Think of what you would save if we had that honest conversation on where our taxes go in the county. This is just a straight business issue. And I think we have to start on day one because many of those candidates, many of those sitting commissioners are going to be running for some other office in the county. And two, at least, will be representing the city directly and two others at large. I think this is a time to get them on the record to understand that municipal residents are paying too much in taxes to the county. We support our schools, we support our libraries, we support citizens, but we should not have to pay for things that we do not get. And that's the biggest thing that we're going to have to do from City Hall to Winchester Hall. Thank you very much. Ms. Young. I don't necessarily think the structure changes the relationship at all, and I don't necessarily see it as a challenge. As I said last night, I don't see challenges. I see opportunities. With a new group, with a new structure, with an organization that has a seat in the table in Annapolis, the city has an opportunity. But let me correct some things that Ms. Dougherty just said about this administration being unwilling to fight the tax duplication bill. I brought up tax differential four years ago, 
and I have fought for a more equitable situation all along. There's somebody in the audience that got a letter from me saying we need to relook that 20-year-old formula. It's antiquated. There are 21 services duplicated by city and the county. Our citizens must get a reimbursement that's more equitable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. McClellan. I think that having a, a new form of uh, government for the county is a, a benefit to the, not only the city of Frederick, but all the municipalities within the, the county. Um, we, we know this form of government, uh, municipalities do. So I think we should be able to be able to provide them assistance. I think that the challenge is going to be, it's going to be a new form of government to them, and they're going to have to muddle through their first couple years on how they do it. So I think we're here to help support them and help them help us. Ms. Doherty. The city and the county have to work together on many, many things. I'll introduce the brown bag lunches where the city officials have uh, a a monthly meeting with NAC leaders, Neighborhood Advisory Council leaders, elected officials on every level, students who are interested in government, so that we can have a conversation about the important issues facing city residents and have that uh, over a meal versus over a gavel and perhaps pre create stronger relationships. That can start right away, but they, the county commissioners and, and state level officials have to hear from us and they have to hear from the residents as well.